Hi, everyone. We're just waiting for a few more people to join us before we start the webinar. Hello, welcome to Be Waste Wise. Uh, I'm Shweta Vandapani, I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. And the topic for today's webinar is environmental justice in waste and recycling. We have Megan Quinn, who's a reporter at Waste Dive. She is moderating today's webinar. She's moderated other webinars on Be Waste Wise, which you will find on the video panel section on, the, on our website. Please go there and you will see the older webinars. Today, Megan is gonna talk to four speakers, three of whom are here. Uh, the fourth speaker will join us shortly. We have uh, Matthew Carmel, who's an environmental attorney at uh, Riker Danzig. We have Michael Haddock, associate professor at the University of Maine, uh, Brianne Berry, postdoctoral research associate at the University of Maine, and Jose Almanzar, who's an environmental counsel at Safe Arts Shaw LLP. Uh, hi, Jose. <laughs> Just about joined and as we start. Just a reminder to all the attendees, please use the Q&A section for your questions, use the chat to introduce yourselves or to add any other comments that you would want the speakers to have a look at. And that's it from my end. Over to you, Megan. Great. Well, thanks for everyone for being here. Thanks to the panelists for uh, joining us. Um, I'm Megan Quinn. I'm a reporter with Waste Dive. Uh, we cover the waste and recycling industry. And um, we have a huge topic to talk about today, so we're not going to get to everything in an hour. I'm really excited for this group of folks to chat because everyone has uh, pretty diverse uh, disciplines and uh, backgrounds on how they came to this work. Um, if you are just getting familiar with environmental justice and the scope of the waste and recycling industry, there are a lot of different definitions of um, how we get at environmental justice. Uh, you know, the US EPA has their own uh, definition. A lot of states have their own definitions. In general, how I generally like to talk about it is, you know, everyone has basic rights to, you know, clean air, clean water, communities that are not polluted. And there's a lot of responsibilities that um, individuals, um, companies, organizations have to make sure that they're not putting undue impacts on um, people living in different environments. So um, all of our panelists are joining us from the US today. So we have a pretty US-centered um, conversation, um, though um, you know, we're interested in kind of how this will interplay with uh, how environmental justice is uh, talked about and um, you know, executed in, in other countries as well. So yeah, I just wanted to, because everyone uh, has a unique sort of background in this, I wanted to just give each of our speakers an opportunity to talk about how they came to this work and what they're sort of working on within this context. So um, I wanted to start with uh, Jose. Jose, do you want to talk about your background and what you do in the environmental justice space? Sure. Thank you, Megan, and thank you for having me, uh, Waste Dive, and everyone, all my co-panelists. Um, so I came into this work uh, sort of by mistake. I, uh, as a 16-year-old, um, I grew up in the city. I should, I should let everyone know I grew up in New York City where uh, nature, if you're lucky, was uh, maybe you went to Central Park or you lived near you know, some of the big parks in Brooklyn. Um, I, I was not so fortunate. I lived in a um, mostly uh, overdeveloped and urbanized neighborhood like most in New York. So um, when I was 16, I, I had a, the fortunate event of having an internship that um, allowed me to uh, be out in nature for about six weeks. And that uh, something happened that internship where uh, just an interest in, in conservation, the environment um, struck in me and I declared environmental studies. Uh, in college, I went to Binghamton University and uh, I was an environmental scientist for a few years. Uh, and then I realized I, I wanted to kind of double down on my um, environmental experience and I went to law school. And uh, since then, I've been practicing uh, environmental law for over a decade, uh, applying some of the uh, science and, and chemical, you know, studies that, that I gathered over the years um, as a practicing private attorney. So sometimes I'm on the plaintiff side, sometimes I'm on the defendant side, sometimes I'm just helping clients navigate kind of thorny issues. Um, and in that capacity, I'm the co-chair of, excuse me, the chair of the Environmental Justice Committee for the New York State Bar Association. Um, so I, I try to put an equity lens in almost everything that I do. Um, because I feel like that the equity and the justice portion of 
um, everything we're trying to accomplish for our clients sometimes gets uh, forgotten or it's not even at the table. So that's how I try um, in, in you know high summary how I try to incorporate kind of my personal experiences um, as an immigrant, as someone that grew up in a, a predominantly minority community um, and studied this and has been for over 25 years, um, both academically and professionally, I try to incorporate all of that into, um, into what I do. Great, uh, thanks for that. Um, Bree, uh, tell us what uh, you're working on and how you came to this space. Yeah, thanks. It's uh, really wonderful to be here today with all these wonderful folks. Um, so my name is Bree Barry. I'm a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Maine. Uh, in the Department of Anthropology. And uh, my research really focuses on the social dimensions of more circular economies. So um, we often kind of push towards circularity for the environmental benefits, but there hasn't been a lot of attention to what changing circular economy, what making more circular economies does to people and to our social systems. So I focus on systems of reuse, um, but also, um, recently and what we're going to talk a little bit about today, um, trying to look at how people are talking about justice in circular economy space, because there's often an understanding that um, these are more just economic systems. Um, and we're kind of trying to figure out exactly what justice means in the context of circularity. Um, so that's, um, that's where my research sits and I'll, I'll leave it there and I'm excited for this conversation. Great, thanks. And then uh, we also have Bree's colleague, Michael. Um, who's also with you, Maine. Uh, tell us about yourself and, and your work. Hi, good morning and good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. I'm also very excited to be here and very happy to be part of this panel um, and looking forward to this interdisciplinary discussion of environmental justice um, and sustainability as it relates to waste and materials management. Um, I'm in the Department of Sociology at the University of Maine, um, and I define myself as both an economic and also an environmental sociologist. So my research really focuses on the uh, creation of markets for goods that have environmental values as well as economic values. In particular, I've done a lot of work on the development of the organic foods market in the United States. Um, and I've approached that topic with a couple of questions in mind. One is tracing um, the history of uh, the regulatory infrastructure that supports that market in the United States. A second is looking at um, relationships between different factions within that community, people who have different visions of what sustainability might look like, what it might be, and how they negotiate their differences within that environment. Um, and then the third is considering, and this is particularly relevant for this conversation, considering what sorts of ideas and values are part of um, that community, uh, part of those regulations, and which are excluded. And one of the things that I found in that research that translates into the work that Bree and I will be talking about today is that um, sort of rich and um, sophisticated notions of justice often don't um, uh, find a place in those markets that are built around environment uh, values of sustainability or, or, or a discourse of sustainability. So my previous research really focuses on, on food production, food systems, um, but in the last uh, year or two, I've developed a focus as well on the other end, uh, waste management um, and uh, materials management, considering those same questions in, in that environment. Thank you, Megan. Great, thank you. And uh, we also have uh, Matt Carmel from Transatlantic. Um, tell us about yourself and your work. Absolutely. So I'm Matt Carmel. I'm an environmental attorney at a law firm uh, you know, based in New Jersey and New York. And I've been involved in the waste industry for, for a long time. And I came to uh, environmental justice through the waste industry. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of work with organics recycling, food waste recycling, and composting companies. And a nonprofit group came to me and explained that in New Jersey, um, community gardens are not allowed to compost without an expensive permit. And so we have urban disadvantaged communities who wanted to do you know, healthy you know, waste management within their community that were prohibited to from a regulatory perspective. And so they explained to me the concepts of environmental justice and how that worked. And that was, I think, five or six years ago. And you know, I've been helping them to revise those regulations so that we can address environmental justice in a way that isn't really talked about, I think, that much from a solution side instead of a compliance side. 
And then, you know, since then I've been involved with the topic of environmental justice pretty extensively, you know, speaking and writing on the topic, including the intersection with the waste and recycling industry. I've represented a variety of businesses and community groups in connection with environmental justice in the waste and recycling industry, whether that's site development and permitting and the impact of environmental justice, mergers and acquisitions and the issue of due diligence relating to environmental justice, or just environmental compliance issues. Um, so I've, I've been lucky to have a lot of experiences and, and be able to really understand this in a state where we have very, uh, you know, groundbreaking environmental justice policies. Great. Uh, thanks for that. And um, so Matt's talking about policy and, and uh, legislation. So that's kind of where I wanted to start. Um, and uh, I wanted to pose this first question to Jose um, as a New York person. Um, New York just passed a you know, pretty significant environmental justice law. Um, can you kind of walk us through uh, what that entails, sort of how it's meant to protect uh, communities and um, how it's going to be impacting folks that are operating in the waste and recycling space? So um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, Megan, which legislation you're referring to. So I'm going to cover two of them because they kind of go hand in hand. Um, the, the first big um, and we'll call it environmental justice legislation, but it's New York's kind of groundbreaking climate legislation that was signed by Governor, uh, then Governor Cuomo in 2019. Um, it's a Community Leadership and Climate Protection Act um, signed in, in the summer of uh, 2019, which seeks to revolution, revolutionize and basically bring New York's entire economy off the fossil fuel based grid. Now, what does that mean for the waste industry? Um, the details are still being worked on, but eventually um, we're gonna need better uh, methane, uh, methane detection and methane uh, leak, leak uh, collection. Uh, we're gonna possibly um, have to find ways to um, avoid incinerating waste um, to deal with uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And as part of the, that CLCPA, the 2019 legislation, um, it dovetails with a, a term that's currently being defined called disadvantaged communities, which once that, that term, the, the, that term is defined um, by the regulators, uh, which is the New York State DEC, it'll provide um, the, the groundwork for, uh, one, for funds to become available to those communities. Um, the CLCPA mandates that 40% of green tech, and let's just call it green investment, go to disadvantaged communities. So um, once that term is defined, and it's, it's based on census tracts, it's kind of like EPA's EJ screen mapping tool, if um, anyone here is familiar with it, where you plug in different metrics and they give you sped out a map. Um, this will be similar where it'll give you which communities are considered disadvantaged based on income or um, a racial or ethnic demographic. Um, the other legislation, Megan, which I think you might have been referring to, um, excuse me if I wasn't clear, um, is one that's been signed by the state, uh, both, both houses in the state. Um, it's a cumulative impacts legislation. That's kind of the broad way to look at it. Hasn't been signed by Governor Hochul yet. Uh, it's sitting on her desk. She has until the end of the year to act on it. Um, I've been in a few behind the scenes meetings with EJ advocates and um, individuals from the business community. Um, both are uh, understand the importance of this legislation. But what it basically does is um, it applies both to the Environmental Quality Review Act and the DEC permits were now cumulative impacts, not just air, but also cumulative impacts of all environmental um, issues uh, should be considered by the DEC or the lead agency under the Quality Review Act. Um, and if cumulative, you know, if a permit renewal or a new permit will exacerbate um, issues in communities, that permit right now as it stands, um, as the legislation is drafted, should be denied which is a huge um, <laughs> point of contention for the business community. And, and it should be uh, certainly something, you know, if, if the waste community wasn't paying attention to this legislation, I'm telling you now, something that you should be paying attention to um, because it, it could impact, you know, the future of your operations. Now, 
I can't say, and I'm not a fortune teller, whether that's a good or a bad thing. But what I do know is that this type of legislation is about 40 years in the making. Um, you know, I think we all need to recognize that part of the problem that environmental justice tries to redress is um, trying to undo generations or legacies of wrongs um, dating back in the United States um, to redlining practices of over 100 years where communities um, were, were basically categorically determined by people behind the scenes, government, industry alike, that certain communities were not worthy or of having certain amenities or investment. And, and that's an issue that we're trying to deal with now. How do you remedy something that has taken over 100 years to um, manifest um, without upsetting some others? You know? and, and that's a balancing act. So New York is is uh, really at the forefront. I know Matthew can speak a little about New Jersey, but um, you know they're, they're always kind of competing in this space as to who's who's got the tougher legislation or who's who cares the most, which is, uh, you know, I guess it's well-intentioned. It's just a little little uh, brotherly love, I guess you could say, between the two states. Yeah, well, you set me up perfectly to throw this next question uh, to Matt, um, since Matt does practice in New Jersey, which is another state that um, I think in 2020 uh, passed their big EJ uh, law that is just now we're starting to see more details of how it might, how it will be implemented. Um, can you go over a little bit about um, what's happening in New Jersey um, and sort of same thing, like how is that going to be affecting the waste and recycling sphere? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as, as Jose said, New Jersey and New York compete a little bit. And, and so New Jersey got there first on the more aggressive law, but New Jersey has a long history of environmental justice policy. And I think it's helpful to talk about the history a little bit because other states and countries and places are different places along the spectrum of where you're going. So you see policies that come in a lot of different forms. You see what I'd call like task force policies, which are you know, committees that are convened to consider environmental justice issues and make proposals, but that don't have I'd say, direct substantive authority to influence state actions or to influence private business actions. And then I think another trend that we see is energy legislation, climate change legislation that has an environmental justice component like New York Climate Leadership Act that, that Jose was talking about. Um, and some Midwest states also have you know, similar as this Connecticut that focus more, I'd say, on energy. Um, and then you have, I'd say, more broader cumulative impacts legislation, disproportionate impact legislation that Jose was talking about as well. And that's what we're getting to in New Jersey. We've had different versions of all the, of all the others leading up to that. And Governor Murphy signed New Jersey's environmental justice law in 2020, um, which on its face, you know, what it does is it says certain facilities that are located in overburdened communities, which are based on socioeconomic factors that are seeking permits in certain instances have to conduct environmental justice impact statement. And if they would have if they would contribute to a disproportionate impact in the overburdened community, then we go into the permit shall be denied or conditioned. And there's a lot of nuance to it, but it's it's a it's a restrictive requirement saying, you know, you have to either impose conditions or get the permit denied if it would have a disproportionate impact. I think disproportionate impact may be obvious to many on this in this presentation, but you know, it, it's really if you were to put one more grain of sand, you know, if, if pollution from a facility was sand, you put one more grain of sand in a cup and it was going to overflow, then you would ha potentially have the disproportionate impact, cumulative impact. Um, it, it's just that little extra thing. So we're considering each facility's contribution and, and that helps to change the overall impacts on the communities. With respect to the waste industry in New Jersey, a large portion is subject to the new environmental justice law. Um, you know, uh, all solid waste facilities, recycling facilities over a certain size, you know, lots and lots and lots of different types of facilities. Um, and so New Jersey also has this inter intersection where 
changes to waste and recycling facilities are heavily controlled via permitting. You know, very small process changes, very small equipment changes require permit changes. And so that is seeming like it's going to lead to a very uh, aggressive application of this law of the waste and recycling industry in New Jersey. Great. Um, I want to ask both of you a little more about um, some of the nuts and bolts of these things, but I also um, want to make sure that we uh, talk a little bit about some of these um, social aspects um, that both Bree and Michael have um, talked about in their research. And um, so, Michael, um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your uh, the research that uh, you and the rest of your team have done, um, specifically um, in this uh, research that you just did, talking about how um, circular economy reports um, a lot of, you know, we're seeing a lot of municipalities, a lot of recycling folks, uh, banks, things like that, putting out how we're these reports of like how we're approaching the circular economy, what we're going to do. And in your study, you mentioned a lot about this idea of like neoliberal justice and sort of this framing of um, sort of approaching it from that angle. Can you untangle that a little bit um, just broadly about sort of like what your, uh, the team's research found and sort of why that's important in this space? Yeah, certainly. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that question, Megan. Um, so I'm going to um, sort of move from the details of state um, policy now to more bird's eye um, academic uh, uh, view. Um, and your question is, is specifically about a paper um, that our research team uh, just published in the journal Local Environment. And Bree was the lead author on that paper. So I was part of the research team um, that, um, that did the analysis and, and, and wrote the paper. Um, and in that paper, what we were interested in doing is exploring the discourse of the circular economy. Um, and that, that term, um, if you're not familiar, I'm sure many people are, but it refers to arrangements that instead of um, going from production to consumption to waste, um, take that waste and um, uh, develop ways in which it can be used as resources. So put back into a production process so instead of a linear economic relationship. Um, we have a circular relationship that um, that reduces waste by moving it back into uh, back into production. So one thing that we noticed is that when uh, people uh, both in the United States and internationally talk about the circular economy and make arguments that we need to move economic arrangements in that direction, they talk about three sorts of benefits, economic benefits, environmental benefits, but also social benefits. And our starting point in the paper was kind of the observation that although the economic and environmental benefits have been subjected to a lot of study, um, the claims that the circular economy generates social benefits, right, in the area of justice, um, that's kind of um, uh, been given lip service, but it hasn't been subjected to a lot of careful analysis. And that's really what we wanted to do um, to do in this paper. So what we did is we collected um, what we called gray literature. So these are reports about the circular economy um, from businesses, from nonprofit organizations, um, from some municipal governments, um, and uh, from uh, as well as from venture capitalists as well, all of which were speaking to the benefits of the circular economy. And we mined those reports, we examined those reports to uh, consider how they talked about justice. Um, that's kind of the background of the paper. We were interested in what sort of framings and what sort of claims um, they were making about how circular economic arrangements uh, could and would advance, uh, advance social justice. We also um, uh, noted that justice is a contested uh, concept, and this is where we get into the literature about environmental justice um, and your question, Megan. Um, uh, we used uh, the academic literature on environmental justice in the United States, as well as the international literature about climate justice, uh, to identify uh, four different framings or four different um, registers that people use to talk about uh, justice and to make justice claims. We identified uh, distributive justice, um, uh, procedural justice, um, compensatory justice, and the last one you mentioned, uh, neoliberal justice, Megan, um, that, that last concept. And the argument we made based on the literature is, okay, those first three types, um, distributive, compensatory, procedural justice, 
they all make the argument that in order to achieve environmental justice, in order to achieve social justice, you have to critically analyze and work to change existing social and economic arrangements. Whereas the last one, neoliberal justice, has a different understanding of what justice would entail. Um, that uh, framing suggests that um, justice can be achieved, inequalities can be reduced solely through the use of market mechanisms. And we as academics had um, some problems with that. We suggested that it really doesn't provide uh, the conceptual tools to engage with entrenched sort of um, institutionalized historically created um, uh, structures of inequality that are so important when it comes to thinking about environmental justice. So really in looking at these reports about the circular economy, what we were interested in understanding was, do they engage with these richer, uh, more critical uh, ways of thinking about justice, or do they rely on neoliberal framings that suggest that really justice inequalities can be addressed mainly through the extension of markets, creating upper entrepreneurial opportunities um, without engaging uh, and critically thinking about some of those established and entrenched patterns of inequality. Um, and the kind of takeaway from her research, um, which wasn't super surprising, but I think important to say nonetheless, is that a lot of this discourse about the circular economy does not engage with those deeper, richer understandings of justice that come out of environmental justice, out of climate justice, and instead really does rely mainly on neoliberal framings of justice. Um, and we saw that as a, a weakness, as a, an area for future development in thinking about the circular economy. Great, yeah, thanks for that. Um, and I think one interesting takeaway, you know, what we're talking about right now is um, how are we as, you know, individuals and also businesses, um, operations, um, looking at, you know, how like the real wor world works and people's real lived experiences. Um, as Jose mentioned, you know, like we, the US, our country has a history of racism, redlining, a lot of things that, um, you know, a lot of the discussions about environmental justice are like, step one is just acknowledging that. And step two is sort of how are we having these tougher conversations um, and what, you know, what kind of actual steps are we taking to remedy that in, um, you know, in the waste and recycling industry, but also in all kinds of industries. So um, my question for you, Brie, too, is um, curious about, uh, because there was a lot of research that you all did, but there's also, um, I'm curious about some of the stronger examples that you found of maybe approaches to the circular economy and social and environmental justice that you felt like actually do encapsulate some of these more helpful um, sort of considerations. Um, what, what examples did you find that you feel like are good um, examples for folks to sort of lean on? Yeah, um, so I, I, maybe it's helpful to say like what these other kinds of justice really are. So we talk about what we're looking for. So when Michael talks about procedural justice, it's the idea that diverse voices are included in design and implementation of for, for our re research circular economy programs and proposals. When we talk about distributive justice, it's the fair distribution of benefits and burdens, environmental benefits and burdens. And when we talk about comp compensatory justice, it's the idea that we need to somehow pay, not necessarily with money, but somehow pay for past harms, right? Past harms were um, <clears throat> committed and, and there's a need to, to atone for that. Um, so in the research we did, um, as Michael said, um, there's a definite bent in the circular economy, the ways that circular economy is, is addressing justice. Um, and we don't see a lot of these stronger forms of justice um, being discussed, um, but that, that's not true across the board. Um, so I'll give you a concrete example. Um, one of the things that we were looking at is claims about jobs, right? And there's this idea um, across the circular economy policy literature that um, just giving people jobs, the, the quantity of jobs um, is a form of justice, right? Giving people access to jobs. And um, we kind of make the case that that's not, that's not a, a form of justice, but there are folks who are thinking about this um, in different ways, right? So Circular Charlotte is a great example. Um, so the city of Charlotte, North Carolina in the US uh, produced this report um, on how it could build a more circular 
economic system. Um, and they had a goal of giving unemployed people the right type of training or experience to have meaningful circular jobs, right? So what's important there is um, who is gonna have access to these jobs and what kind of jobs they will be. So it's not about quantity as much as it is about quality and access, right? So there's an acknowledgement that there are folks who are in need of jobs and they need meaningful jobs. Um, and they also prioritize access to these circular jobs uh, for folks with difficulty accessing the labor market. So here we see the acknowledgement that benefits and burdens have not been equally distributed and that um, to have uh, meaningful jobs is really critical. So um, it's maybe important to note that this is an aspirational document, right? They're not mapping out what has been done, but um, what could be done. Um, so jobs is one key area. There's also lots in that report um, that is looking at who needs to participate in the decision-making process, who should have a, a say in um, enacting these programs and policies. And they're really um, focused on including diverse voices. Um, so I guess what, what was really critical for us and what we see hope in is um, there, there are folks who are thinking about this and um, putting putting plans into place. Um, but probably the point Michael and I really want to slam home is that um, uh, circulate, circular economies are not inherently just, right? Um, we have to do the work to make them, to design programs that will be just. Um, and we need to think carefully about what we mean when we talk about justice um, so that we're not just um, saying they're, they're social benefits um, and, and not actually putting any plans in place that will achieve those. Um, so we do see some promise there, but um, really we see a lot of opportunity, uh, opportunity for folks to kind of pick this up and, um, and work with it in a meaningful way. Um, Great. And I actually wanted to get to an audience question, which I think, um, how, this is a really interesting way to look at this too. When we talk about, you know, there's a lot of uh, work to be done um, and we're seeing um, one of those uh, ways of doing that work is at the municipal level, like you mentioned the city of Charlotte. Um, and then there's also um, the, the state level, you know, places like New Jersey and New York. And then we had this reader question, which is really interesting about um, Richard Thompson asks, uh, do states that an act, you know, these strengthened environmental legislation um, do they find that polluting activities are actually going to other states with lower standards? So, you know, I guess the question of like, you know, work is being done in one area, is that pushing harm elsewhere? Um, and maybe this is a question that for Jose and, and Matt first, um, do you have any thoughts on that? Is that something that you're seeing like as New York and New Jersey enact this legislation and, and um, you know, and other things, um, is that, pushing some of this bad acting other places? Well, I'll start. I mean, for this is not a new phenomenon. Um, and New York has been for a long time um, sending a big chunk of its um, municipal solid waste and hazardous waste to places like Pennsylvania, Ohio, um, where there's either just more uh, land available that's dedicated for for that kind of infrastructure. Um, I think what what we might see, and Matthew, you might disagree, but I think what we might see is if if the legislation becomes um, so onerous for the business uh, business interest to make a, a good return on investment, because um, that's usually the driver a lot of these things. Um, you, you may start to see some of these facilities um, either uh, scale down in size or just completely move out of the state, which will um, set a whole chain of events um, that, that could result in more uh, refuse going out of state. Absolutely. Um, I think that there is a middle ground and, and unfortunately, I don't know where that lies, but I, I'm really glad that um, these discussions are happening um, both within corporate boards, but also within um, the executive branch and certainly the legislature. Um, these are uncomfortable discussions. The easy thing is to find a, uh, a, a virgin plot of land, raise it uh, and dig a new impoundment and start a new landfill that will be there for 30 or 40 years. Um, Circular economy and, and principles of circular economy is is a way 
to get there, but it's not going to solve. I don't think we can engineer our way out of this. Uh, I think this. I think we need kind of a collective um, reckoning that we we are where we are for decisions that were made from our our. Um, I'll just call them our ancestors, um, three or four generations back, and we need to. Uh, recognize and reconcile kind of the damage that's been done in, in the name of infrastructure. Um, and then once we have that reckoning, then we can start maybe connecting with our communities. We can maybe start crafting better solutions. I know that sounds very mystical or whimsical, um, but I don't think we can get, I don't think we can, I, mean, I really mean this, I don't think we can engineer our way out of this. So I agree. I think, you know, picking up on some of the threads that Jose was talking about, um, you know, certainly there's a balance of interests and perspectives and and the in industry is concerned that compliance costs, burdens of compliance are going to be are going to override profits and community groups want a seat at the table and want their rights protected to, you know, clean air, clean water, all, all of those basic human rights. Um, and, and so I think some of the arguments we've heard in New Jersey is that it's going to drive certain industries out. It's usually discussed from an economics perspective. You know, don't be harder on businesses than you already are, than a shift in pollution. Um, and, and the other point I'll, I'll make is that um, it can be really hard to move some of these industries that are subject. You know, when we talk about the energy industry, that's that that's hard to move out of state um, you're gonna you're gonna so so to some extent this law is just going to re these laws these policies will just reshape um, you know existing industries within states but where things can move you're just going to have a balancing of does it push the economics too far um, and that's something I think you always hear from industry uh, so it, it's hard exactly to say. I'm not sure that we've really seen it in New Jersey yet, but we're not fully implemented in our law yet. You know, I, I want to mention something, um, Matthew, that you you just mentioned. These industries, and, and this particularly the one of the big problems is that we can pass all these laws and legislations and regulations. One, if they're not enforced, um, that it's you know it's a moot point. I mean, I live in a, um, I'm in New Hampshire at the moment, but I live in a, in, a, in a pretty, you know, affluent part of Nassau County and the environmental activists, local environmental activists fought for years to pass a tree ordinance. You can't cut a tree down from your front yard um, without getting a certain permit. And if you do have to, you know, replace it or the, remove the tree, you have to replace it with two in kind. That law has been in the books for three years, it's not being enforced whatsoever. So we can we can speak in theory, um, but to, to your point, Matt, some of these things are very difficult to move and they've been there for 40 or 50 years. Um, we project waste is gonna keep going up, especially in urban and urban settings. So no one really likes to speak about this, but do we relocate people? If we can't, if we can't move the facilities out of the neighborhoods so they've been zoned, and are within their legal right to operate, but we also invited uh, certain people, regardless of you know, like socioeconomic backgrounds, to live near those facilities. And we know the environmental and health, human health harm of the people living within an eighth of a mile of five polluting facilities. And maybe the solution is to relocate people. Um, and we can, and I'm not saying that that's, that's just one way of looking at it. It's, um, I, I know we don't like to use the word reparations. We got to kind of shh, say, you know, don't don't use the R word because you're going to upset certain people. But um, maybe that's part of the reckoning is saying that, hey, this hasn't worked out for 75 years and people are getting are still very sick. Um, and we can keep spinning our wheels as to how to reduce knocks and how to um, improve, you know, bike lanes. Which is, sometimes people just don't need to be near polluting facilities. <laughs> And I think that's the counterbalance to the compliance costs question, because yes, compliance costs are relevant, but impact on the community is at the heart of the environmental justice. As one of our you know, questioners in the Q&A pointed out, absolutely. You know, remedying 
the impacts, the, the long-term burdens that Jose was talking about previously, you know, the generations of, of redlining and of, of citing polluting facilities and under and disadvantaged communities, that's what this is about. Um, we have to find a balance because we have to move forward, but you know, it is important to remember that that is the touchstone. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, to your point of you know, once something is established, it's really hard to you know change it, uproot it, correct course. Um, and I think one of the questions in the chat is about sort of like future zoning and planning issues um, and what else we can do in that regard, especially for you know planners who are maybe for the first time trying to take um, EJ considerations into account. Um, do you have any thoughts on um, either how that's being handled currently or, you know, other ways that, you know, you feel would be a helpful way to sort of get at that in the future? Well, the Euclidean zoning model that most of the United States um, functions under, um, except for there's a few municipalities that don't have zoning, like Houston uh, doesn't have any zoning ordinance, which blows my mind. Um, <laughs> but the Euclidean zoning that gave us um, industrial zones overlaid with commercial zones, but then you can have, you know, certain types of residential areas within, you know, you could have multifamily, you can't have single family, but you can put, you know, it's a eight story building with uh, 20 units. That model is inherently um, just broken and I don't know how to how to undo that what I have seen in in zoning kind of moving forward is a, a lot of emphasis on uh, sustainability and creating uh, moving away from an automobile based economy so creating more um, avenues for uh, and I don't mean little avenues but just avenues for pedestrian or bicycling and so a lot, but not a lot on, I haven't seen a lot of um, attention being put on kind of a, a justice lens on, on how do we um, undo some of the wrongs, because that's part of justice. You, you, it's very convenient to just move, all right, well, we've screwed up for 120 years, but let's think about the next 20. Well, no, you have to kind of, un, you have to undo, you have to try, at least try to unpack some of the wrong and, and there needs to be a model zoning ordinance out there that gets adopted that incorporates sustainability, greenhouse gas issues, um, affordability, community kind of aspect, knowing your neighbors. Uh, so many neighborhoods in, in the United States, you, you know, you can go days without even seeing another person because you're just in your car and, and go to a store and then back to your house. So um, that's a long winded way of saying I, I've seen some improvements, but not, not enough. Yeah, I think zoning is a hard way to address this because of some of the nuanced legal issues of pre-existing uses, grandfathering, those types of things, so, you know, legacy uses. So it, it's difficult. I think there are some municipalities, cities that are trying to use the zoning model to address environmental justice. Uh, I think the success that I've seen has been in long-term planning and you know, akin to brownfields redevelopment areas where you take an area and you say, okay, I wanna change this from you know, a derelict industrial area to a vibrant you know, resident, mix, residential mixed use, et cetera. And that's going on in Newark, New Jersey right now and some of the port areas. And I think those are long processes that are more visionary and shaping you know, and, and encouraging and incentivizing. They're more carrot than stick, you know, so to speak. Um, and, and I think that is going to be more successful in the, in the zoning context uh, than more, more punitive zoning, but that's just my belief. I wanted to jump in there too, and just um, especially thinking about brownfields and um, one thing that's helpful for me in thinking about justice is, um, you know, the idea of fair distribution of benefits and burdens. Um, so we talk a lot about the burdens of, especially communities of color, right? They're, you know, being dumped on, right, and cited next to um, toxic facilities. Um, but when we talk about fair access to benefits, it's it's important to keep that in mind too. So often when we do um, redevelopment programs, uh, 
we also see waves of gentrification and uh, the people whose communities were improved uh, can no longer live there. So um, it's important to like, these programs alone are not gonna be just unless we build that in, right? Unless we build in um, mechanisms to keep people in those communities who um, have a long history there, even as we improve them. Yeah, and, and to your point, um, one of the questions in the chat is um, from Ivy about, you know, what aspects of the circular economy like are prone to environmental injustice. You just gave a good example. Are there others that you run into in your, either in your research or that you just um, would want to point out in terms of like sort of from your side of things? Yeah, I, um, thanks for that question, Ivy. Um, I think it really, uh, it, it goes back to, to Bree's point about um, benefits and burdens, thinking about bo both benefits and burdens. So when we consider aspects of circular economy or circular economic arrangements that might be prone to injustice, we need to keep both of those things in, in mind. So you can imagine um, circular arrangements that impose uh, burdens on communities that have historically faced many such burdens. So for example, recycling is certainly uh, you know, a traditional well-established circular economic practice, but recycling requires that um, sorting facilities be constructed, that MRFs be built. And we then have the question of where do we put those MRFs, right? Are they placed in um, neighborhoods that already have a lot of environmental burdens and now have to deal with the fumes of trucking materials to those facilities, with the odors that those facilities produce with any sorts of environmental hazards? that they generate, um, or do we actually consciously you know, ask that question, pose that question to ourselves, where should these um, facilities be cited with a, a mind to considering those historical patterns of injustice, right? So that's a situation where uh, circular economic arrangements could easily go in the direction of greater injustice, or they could um, be addressed in such a way as to uh, to challenge and to work toward remediating those historical um, injustices. We also need to think about the quality of jobs, right? Um, there's a lot of discourse in the circular economy literature about how it will create jobs. Well, jobs can be good jobs that provide a livelihood to the individuals who work at those jobs. They can also be hazardous, uh, providing uh, barely subsistence wages. Um, if we don't ask those questions, we very much risk going in the direction of poor quality jobs, right, um, which uh, do not provide significant benefits to communities um, that face other obstacles and face historic injustices. On the other side, we need to ask about the benefits, right? Entrepreneurial opportunities is talked a lot about in the context of circular economies, wealth generation, who is going to benefit from those opportunities, who is going to receive that wealth. Um, those are other questions we can ask as well. So there is a very real risk as um, societies move in the direction of circularity in economic arrangements. There is a very real risk that those circular economic arrangements will simply reproduce the sorts of inequalities and injustices that exist in linear economic arrangements. And, and our argument is that the only way to avoid that is to uh, develop a vocabulary for asking these questions and to also pose those questions and to uh, uh, address, them, uh, address them very consciously. I also just wanna mention um, uh, sort of returning to the point that Jose made, you know, um, uh, creating that, um, uh, that thinking about how um, we can move forward by undoing or addressing past wrongs. In our research, we use the um, category of compensatory justice to ask that question. To what extent do uh, uh, advocates of circular economies um, consider the ways in which those economies can make reparations for historical wrongs and historical injustices? Um, but one of the most striking findings was we did not find a single mention, I think, Brie, correct me if I'm wrong, but a single mention of compensatory justice in the 23 reports that we examined. So we saw that as a very significant oversight and a place where thinking really does need to develop in advocacy for, for circular economic arrangement. Megan, I want to mention something that um, to pick to dovetail off of kind of what Michael just mentioned. There's a lot. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, and, and there's this idea that if we and, and Matthew mentioned this earlier, like using a, a the stick approach, I think this carrot and stick. We're stuck in this kind of hamster wheel 
Because if you think about it, um, regulations and laws um, that are, are restrictive, um, they create burdens on someone to alleviate um, externalities as part of our economic systems. And, and I think, again, corporate decision makers, boards, executive teams, you know, I don't know how to get this message out to the masses without, uh, you know, doing a, a standing on a, a soapbox and screaming it out. But, you know, we need to move off of this notion of, you know, how much harm is allowable. You know, our permit allows us to emit X number of tons of this pollutant. So what can we do to get right up to that threshold? And, and we need to really, there needs to be a, a uh, shifting in the way that we view the world and our interaction with this beautiful earth that we're on um, that was uh, is gifted to us. And it doesn't matter what religion you are or what kind of uh, the theory or principles you adhere to, um, it's undeniable at this point that um, the, you know, the earth is, is a living organism, it's alive, and we are part of that we're part of that greater uh, kind of organism. Many way that bacteria, we allow them to live in our guts and help us thrive the way that we have mitochondria. And, and once we start having this kind of relational um, view of the earth and our neighbors and the communities where our facilities are that, then it makes it easier. It's intuitive to want to do the best and to help. And I'm not saying that you can't have industry, but we need to move towards a, a looking at the environment and us kind of being a part of it. And once that happens, then it then becomes, again, knee jerk reaction to not want to harm the communities where you live at. Um, and that goes beyond engineering, that goes beyond the law. That's more of like a, you know, like we, we need to do some soul searching. Yeah, I sort of double down on that soapbox, if you don't mind, Megan. Um, you know, I think we've come to accept that sustainability and climate centric policies within the corporate structure add to the bottom line. You know, there's been several studies on sustainable investing, on sustainable companies, that companies that support sustainable practices make more money than companies that don't, they're more profitable. The same thing has been shown for diversity. I will posit that I think in two years, we will see studies that show the same thing for environmental justice considerations. Uh, I think that that will, will show up. There is a study from EPA in 2005, which is kind of anecdotal and talks about site permitting. And it had a direct correlation in a small sample size between companies that were doing aggressive environmental justice stakeholdering and considering environmental justice impacts and how quickly and cheaply they were able to permit their facilities. So I, I think this is an area where we'll see more research and I think it will become accepted business knowledge that addressing environmental justice proactively and as a company mission is good for the bottom line. Yeah, this, this all kind of gets to um, one area we haven't talked about a lot, but everyone has been hinting at, which is the relational aspect, the community aspect um, Jose, I mean, mentioned it directly, actually, um, that, you know, like a big part of when I talk to people for my job about, um, you know, what are you doing for environmental justice purposes in your facilities, you know, we hear time and time again, well, we need to like get to know the community better. We need to develop relationships with the community. And I think in all the work that all of you do, stakeholder relationships, um, community building are all things that you've talked about in your work are like written into laws in certain cases. So I'm curious, this is a question for everyone, but um, where are you seeing this happening in your opinion well? Like how is this being executed in a way that you think is effective and gets at these like larger issues of like, you know, being more human relational? Um, yeah, I'm just curious. Uh, I don't know who wants to start, but yeah, where are we seeing these community focused aspects of environmental justice happening and, you know, how effective are they? So can I jump in with a place where it's not happening effectively so I don't bring us all down at the very end? Um, and hopefully someone can have a positive example after me. Um, so there's an anthropologist who works in New York City. Her name is Melissa Checker. And she um, 
writes about um, brownfield redevelopment, among other things, um, in New York City, um, and talks about these extensive um, stakeholder engagement processes that bring um, environmental justice communities into the planning process, which seems great on its face, right? It seems like a, a really, a really strong thing. Um, but what she finds through her research um, is that um, their voices aren't taken seriously and they're actually being like slowly drained, right? Because they're going to all of these meetings, right? She talks about um, activist overload. So they're going to all these meetings, co-designing all of these different plans that never come to fruition, right? They're, their concerns are never actually heard, um, but they're spending all this unpaid time, like throwing themselves against a wall, basically trying to get their voices heard. Um, so I think we have to be careful, um, especially when we think about kind of procedural justice, which you know is, is critical if we're thinking about environmental justice, that it's not just, um, you can't just invite people to the table, you have to listen to them, and then you have to do what they say. <laughs> um, so that's, that's one space where we, there's room for improvement. And maybe someone has a great story about something that's going well. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a great story, but I do think that's a great question. Um, and I think that, you know, we need to approach that really more as a process than as an outcome, uh, that it's not something that sort of we solve and then we know how to do it, but something that people uh, work towards in, in different ways, different ways, shapes and forms and different efforts. Um, I can give a really brief example from research that I do that's um, separate from the paper that we wrote. It's research about um, climate adaptation in Southern Louisiana along the coast of Louisiana. Um, there are a lot of efforts to uh, in that state to try to use the Mississippi River to rebuild wetlands um, and uh, uh, as a way of um, uh, protecting communities from storm surge and from hurricanes. Um, but you know, with any large scale environmental project, they're both winners and losers. And the way that um, those plans were originally developed, the winners would be uh, mainly New Orleans um, and other metropolitan areas. And the losers would be smaller communities along the coast um, that would actually be flooded, uh, potentially flooded by the projects that are being, uh, being proposed. Um, so that's kind of depressing. Um, but one of the things that's happened in recent years um, is an effort by uh, folks who do social science um, in that area to uh, create uh, different ways of evaluating the value of projects, uh, different ways of weighing costs and benefits. So typically projects are um, uh, green lighted based on a pretty simple cost benefit analysis, how much property will be protected, what's the value of protection in monetary terms. And that leads to you know, a higher value placed on projects that might protect a big petrochemical facility um, as opposed to a small low income community, right? Uh, simple cost benefit analysis would lead to a greater protection of the higher value assets. But what social scientists have been working to do is to um, take things like um, the value that people place on living in the same place that they've lived for their entire lives, um, the value of local identities, and um, translate those qualitative things into quantitative measures that can be put into that sort of cost benefit analysis. Um, it's a work in progress, um, but I think there's some pretty innovative work being done in that area. And I do think it's an important thing to do um, uh, to, uh, uh, to move in that direction of, of environmental justice um, in the context of, of a, the massive environmental changes that, that we're experiencing and will experience in the foreseeable future. We have about two minutes left, so I know we're still talking about a complex thing, but we could do that in two minutes. Um, <laughs> So that you have a good story. I mean, I think we should close on a good story. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, and, and so I think what I what I want to um, emphasize is, and and I think uh, Michael might have mentioned this recently uh, in his previous remarks. Like, we're this is dynamic. There is no like we like to think there's a kind of a beginning and an end. Our light, our minds, our, the way our our brains function. We we like kind of this dualistic and beginning and end. It's a nice story. Um, you know, this all stems from civil rights and the civil rights movement. And, and I don't even like to call it a civil rights movement because it makes it seem as if um, there's an end period to seeking justice. Uh, this all just stems from civil rights. And, and, and the fact that we're having this discussion um, in this, you know, in this format 
but uh, Matthew knows and, and I have experience in the last few years, these conversations weren't happening 10 years ago. Um, and in my line of work, um, I work on a lot of mergers and acquisitions, and I have seen, um, it, at least it's coming up in, I'm starting to see more ESG reports as deals get done. And I am starting to see that landfill facilities, some which I represented, are, are very mindful of the expense of litigating a nuisance lawsuit for odor. Um, not even toxic lawsuit, you know, toxic that you're caught. So the conversations are happening, and I think that's that's a positive step. Um, but more than that, I think we are starting to see on the federal side and, and certain states, um, you know, pay more than just just lip service to environmental justice. So I'm, I'm hopeful in that. I don't have a specific anecdote about uh, a great outcome, but what I do sense is that. Um, you know, 40 years of, of, you know, toxic waste and race um, was uh, released, uh, I think, in 1989. So we're, you know, approaching over 30 years of, of that report that said that um, the siting of, you know, toxic facilities, um, race is a predominant factor in that. Um, I think we're starting to see improvements. I'm, I'm not fully, I'm like a cautious optimist. Um, but I'm, I'm really glad that this discussion is happening and now we all need to kind of go into our influences of our circles of influences and, and try to plant enough seeds out there to build some compassion, um, you know, with, with, with what our clients are doing. That's largely what I see as well. And I think that's the, you know, counterbalance to the, um, you know, depletion of resources that Bree was talking about at the beginning, we're entering a new phase where these voices are getting more of a, of a say. And we're having discussions about how those voices get considered. In New Jersey, to bring it back to the law, the, the environmental justice law gives them a voice. And then if the determination, the calculus based on that voice reaches a certain result, it determines the end result of the process. So it's building in the meaningfulness of the public engagement. And so I think we're gonna have this discussion of, is the public engagement meaningful on its own or do we need to set baselines to guide the public engagement? And so I too am cautiously, cautiously optimistic that the discussions are going on and that we are seeing more laws that build in baselines and talk about baselines. Great. Well, I think we're gonna have to leave it there, but I really appreciate everyone's time. Um, this was a really great discussion. Could obviously keep talking about this for far longer. Um, and I apologize for the folks we didn't get to your questions, um, but um, yeah, thanks for uh, being here and participating. And um, I think that's, that's it for me. Thank you, Megan, and thank you to all the speakers. Thanks for your time. And uh, just a reminder: so some of the audience asked about uh, the recording. You will have the you'll have the video recording of this on demand on Zoom. In case uh, you're not able to find it, in a couple of weeks we'll have it up on our website as well as on the YouTube channel. So sign up for our newsletter so you get an update. Thanks a lot. Have a good day, everyone. Bye bye.